Um, I assume that you wouldn't be here if you didn't know something about me. But uh, by way of introduction, I am a professor of early childhood education at Wayne State University. I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, grew up in Columbus, Ohio, attended the public schools of Columbus, Ohio, received my bachelor's degree from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, which is also where my mother and sister attended college, father attended Morehouse, or graduated from Morehouse College. I received a master's of religious education degree from the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, which is the same divinity school my father graduated from. I received my PhD degree from Georgia State University in Atlanta. I did postdoctoral work at the University of California, San Diego and Yale University for about three years, two years at Yale, one year at UCSD. I taught at Jackson State University in Mississippi, taught at Clark College in Atlanta, Georgia, taught at Cleveland State University, um, University of Connecticut, so I've been everywhere. I have three books <clears throat> that I'll refer to. The first is Black Children, Their Roots, Culture, and Learning Styles, which was first released in 1982 and uh, revised in 1986. Uh, Unbank the Fire, Visions for the Education of African American Children was released in 1994 and Learning While Black was released in 2001. <laughs> I am also the mother of a 17 year old son who is 6 feet 9 inches tall <laughs> and will be on the starting five of the Troy Country Day basketball team this year. So I am basketball mom. That's all I do in my life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> just by way of schedule, um, I, this session will go until approximately 11, 11.05. Then we will have a 30-minute break. I think it's designed for people who must leave for class or people who are coming for the second half. And so um, if you want to talk to me or um, I can sign books during that time and then we will have the second half of the presentation from 11.30 to 1 o'clock. So it, you know, I'll see where the natural stopping point is but it will be around 11 o'clock. I would like to begin my presentation by sharing a favorite poem by Ronald Coleman entitled, I Ask You, My Children. I ask you, my children, what did you learn today? Did anyone tell you how to meet tomorrow? Did anyone tell you why there are people who don't know you? Did anyone seem to know who you were? Did anyone know that you have the blood of Africa in your veins? Or did they pretend to be blind to your color and thereby deny its value. What did you learn? Did anyone explain the nature of freedom? Did anyone explain the nature of racism? Did anyone explain the nature of love? <clears throat> did anyone know anything about those things? Did anyone know anything? What did you learn today? I intend to point out in this address this morning that the quality of education African American children are receiving in the schools in which the majority of them are found are far below the quality, is far below the quality most white children receive in suburban and public private schools. African American children are being educated in schools that deliver the girls to public assistance and the boys to unemployment and incarceration. And I make that statement without fear of contradiction because today we have more African American males between the ages of 18 and 22 in prison than we have in college. So we almost have to conceive 
of incarceration as an outcome of public school education, at least for African American males. And even the African American community is not raising the appropriate questions on this issue. <coughs> I was listening to a television program, Detroit Black Journal, and they began the program by citing the statistics about the fact that the punishment industry is the largest growing industry in the country. And I rushed from my kitchen into my family room to hear what solutions they were going to propose. Instead, the topic of the show was how much money is being made in the punishment industry and whether minority entrepreneurs are getting a piece of the pie. Not how we can stem the tide but how we can get some of the money that is being realized through the incarceration of African American males. What I want to bring to your attention today is that African American boys do not just go crazy at 11 years old and begin a downward spiral into failure. I want to make the point that failure is an activity that African American children and their teachers work on actively on a day-to-day -day basis. Ray McDermott says that teachers work so actively with minority children on failure that failure becomes an achievement in urban classrooms. Failure is so much a part of the classroom culture that I submit to you that we could track the children who are placed at table number three in the first week of kindergarten and first grade we could track them throughout their educational experience and watch those children emerge into prison and unemployment. I submit to you that there is very little movement from table number three to table number one over the course of these children's educational careers. I submit to you that the way the children come in is the way they go out. So if your family's on public assistance, you depart school for public assistance. If your parent is in jail, you depart school for jail. The concept of upward mobility in American education has been lost, particularly on African American children. <coughs> Further, in my opinion, there is a disconnection between what African American children are doing in school every day and what one will be called upon to do in the 21st century in order to be economically viable, financially independent, and in a position to make a creative contribution to the society. The children in one set of schools are educated to be governors. Children in the other set of schools are trained for being governed. The former are given the imaginative range to mobilize ideas for economic growth the latter are provided with the discipline to do the mural tasks the first group will prescribe. Societies cannot be all generals, no soldiers. But by the way our schooling patterns proceed, we assure that soldiers' children are more likely to be soldiers and that the offspring of the generals will at least have the option of being generals. They can mess up. They can mess up, but they have a wide latitude to fail, and they have a wide latitude to succeed. The model I'm going to present to you today places the school at the center of the effort to achieve upward mobility for African American children and any children who are from at-risk ethnic groups. And I want to make the point to you that the school is the appropriate focal point for one reason. Everyone in our society is required to go to school. It's that simple reason. It's not beating up on teachers. It's not trying to lay all the problems of the society at the feet of teachers. But it's just a simple fact that everybody's required to go to school. Everybody is not required or guaranteed to have a functional family. You know, many times educators speak about the family as if it's some kind of quantifiable entity, like everybody gets a certain quality of family. 
we have accreditation standards for schools. We have certification standards for teachers. There's no accreditation for families. There's no certification for parents. You have to almost kill somebody for somebody to intervene in your family. You have to already have done something heinous for someone to step in and say this is an inappropriate family. And there's a big range from heinous to quality upbringing and quality family. And that is a central issue. I have been on radio talk shows and all kinds of crazy dialogues with people who talk about the parents ought to do this, the parents, it's not the teacher, it's the parents. I hear this from teachers all the time. And I want to make this one statement. The state of Michigan and each state in this union has a fiduciary responsibility to educate children. They have a legal responsibility. The only thing parents are legally required to do is send their children to school. And when we listen to the debate, you would think it was the absolute responsibility of a parent to convey a K-12 through education to their children. And so if there's nothing you remember about this presentation is the key to having a different way of thinking about how to produce outcomes centers in that debate. We must stop talking about the parents as if they are some kind of quantifiable entity. I spoke once to Maryland, um, to some teachers in Maryland, 400 teachers, and one of them stood up and said to me, a black male, he said, uh, my, my, I grew up in the housing projects, and he said his mother was such a good mother and all that she did to ensure his success. And he said, these parents need to just do what my mother did. And I asked him, would you come to the microphone and tell me and us how we're going to ensure that every single mother in the housing projects do does what your mother did? <laughs> how do we go about doing that? That's a very difficult thing to do, but that's the way we speak of this debate about is it the responsibility of the parents and is it the responsibility of the school. I'm saying to you, we can't get at the parents in a reliable way. If we go into a school and try to transform the way parents parent and the way they function, certainly we're going to get some people. <laughs> we're going to convert some people and we're going to help some people. But is that one person we miss, their child goes down the tube. So the point is, even if we get 90% of the parents to do everything I say do, that last 10% are still going to fall between the cracks. So it seems to me much more reliable for us to begin to look at how we can create schools that educate children. I also want to suggest that many of the intervention programs that are created that we want to um, uplift children, we keep getting the same people over and over again and we keep missing the same people. Um, I was the first director of ACTSO, which is um, an NAACP uh, youth achievement program. Can I get somebody to close this door, please? I shouldn't have left it open. Um, ACTSO is an NAACP youth achievement program. And it's like a science fair, but they have all kinds of different um, competitions. So that, you know, they have art and music and song, as well as engineering and physics and chemistry. So it runs the whole literature, everything. And uh, we had a local con competition in Atlanta. This was 1978. And then our winners went to Portland, Oregon, and they had a national competition. And many of our children won at the national level. But when we sat down to evaluate the program, we had to face the reality that the majority, almost all of the children who signed up for it were middle class. And the children who won everything were middle class. Because it's a middle class activity to even hear about it, to be on the flow of information, to get your application in on time, get your project in on time, pay your money, do the rules. Those are middle class activities. And if we look at many of the things we do to intervene for children who are less fortunate, we keep getting the same people and we keep missing the same people. The school is a reliable entity for penetrating the children who are truly disadvantaged because they are required by law to be there. Now, I want to talk for a few minutes about 
what is wrong with a lot of the educational reform that we have today? And I have a solution for you, but you're probably going to have to stay the whole day to get all the solution. But I want to talk first, so to set the stage for the solution, um, of what things that are wrong. Um, when I read and, and look at most of the reform that's suggested for children, it is come, or schools, it's coming from politicians and it's coming from newspaper columnists. Those are the two groups I see. I do not see educators standing up talking about what is wrong with our efforts and our field. And I feel that we have insight to bear, to me, to bring. Uh, it's like the three blind men trying to figure out what an elephant looks like. One's touching the trunk, one's touching the uh, leg, and one's touching the tail. And then they're trying to piece it together. And I think there are things that are going on in our field that an educator need to, needs to speak to. So I have anointed myself to be that person. I'm self-anointed today. To stand up and say within our field what's wrong. All right, first of all, we have rise, most of the educational reform that is designed punishes the children because nobody has taught them. It's child punishment. So you are a junior in high school and you don't know anything and you can't pass the, the rising junior examination so you don't go any further. Punishment for you. Uh, you have attended high school and completed the 12th grade. When I say complete, I mean you were, were there. And you don't know anything so you get a diploma of attendance. Which means you can't go to college, nobody respects it, but we give you a certificate to show that you were at least here. That's punishment for the child. Then we have teaching to the test. A large amount of what goes on in the education of black children is teaching them how to pass tests. We're not teaching the curriculum. I mean, one of the things that I say to people, if you want to see good education, go to a school where rich white children are. I have a class where um, I have them as an assignment, go spend one hour in a school where the poorest black children in this community are educated. Then go spend one hour in a school where the richest white children are. And then write a paper on it. Just write a paper on what you see in one hour. And the things that are being done with rich white children pedagogically are not being done in schools where African-American children are. A high percentage of their time is being spent uh, preparing for standardized tests and coaching for standardized tests. Education is not being delivered to them in a coherent, interesting, engaging manner. Um, many advocates of school reform want a longer school day and a longer school year. They're not going to do anything different. They're just going to do more of what they've been doing for a longer period of time. That's like taking old medicine and putting it in a new bottle. Then we have people who swear by uniforms. If we can just get the children in uniform, that's going to do it. I mean, when you look at the way African American children are even treated in school, it's almost as if they're preparing them for prison. Like you're going to prison anyway, so we're going to use educational settings to prepare you for that. I mean, if you even look at elementary school classrooms, there have been studies done on the amount of time that's spent on routines, like lining up to walk down the hall and taking their seats. And, you know, you and record keeping and memory. You know, your group messed up yesterday, so you're last today. Uh, just elaborate rituals that, you know, around how the children have to walk down the hall, the facial demeanor. I mean, it's almost like a punitive kind of boot camp environment. And then one of the worst things we're doing today is pushing instruction down to lower grade levels. So that we can't, the children are not doing well in fifth grade math, so we're going to start teaching multiplication in the second grade. What is this? And we're doing this here in Michigan. They pass this, that the solution is not to look at what's going on in fifth grade and how that can be more effective. The solution is that anything can be taught. I, I guess because in early childhood we do it better. I don't know what it is. But, you know, 
I don't know if you all have ever heard of John Piaget. Is there anybody here who's heard of, heard of John Piaget? I mean, one of the things that contributions that he was supposed to have made is he tried to tell us that children's thinking evolves and that they are capable of certain kind of thought at different ages. And you don't just take uh, calculus and start teaching to a three-year-old. That there's supposed to be an unfolding of the intellect. That's what I thought he started in the 1930s and told us. And so we push things down to levels. And this is, you know, levels for children when it, it's more difficult. I mean, for example, you look at multiplication. I don't know about you, but I know the hardest year I had in my life was third grade. Third grade is a very difficult year. The children go through every mathematical operation. And learning multiplication tables is very challenging at third grade. Why do we think they can learn that at second grade? Um, I was invited to a Midwestern school district for a consultation. And I was invited there. The assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction told me that every other week somebody was losing their job on what they were doing with African American males in disciplining them. A white male principal lost his job for beating them. The teachers were taking duct tape and taping the boys to their seats. Another teacher took masking tape and was taping their hands together. I was in Chicago and before I left my hotel room I saw on TV that a substitute teacher was putting duct tape over the children's mouths. And it wasn't, they didn't show the children, but then I knew they were black. The next day, I sh they showed the children. I mean, so this kind of thing's going on? Well, my consultation with them didn't last very long because basically they wanted me to give them a magic pill on discipline. See, if you read my books, I have no section on discipline. I don't talk about discipline in my books. And that's what everybody wants you to talk about. Because that's all we want to do with black children is track them, test them, discipline them, manage them. Nobody wants to talk about how to create an engaging, fun, wonderful learning environment. And when you create an engaging, wonderful learning environment, your disciplinary problems go away. But they didn't want to hear anything I had to say about how the children were being treated, how the environment should be structured. So, you know, I had my five days there and I uh, was able to see a lot of things that were interesting to me that I'm going to share with you. All right, one of the things I did is I asked them, I toured schools that I was able to select and I selected them based on the income level of the children. Every school I went in, I said, can I see the kindergarten because I'm in early childhood education. When I walk into every one of those kindergartens, they look like first grade. They explained to me that they put some preschools in the building and took the kindergarten classroom for the preschools and then moved the kindergarten children to the first grade classrooms. So that the chairs were all facing the chalkboard in rows. I said, well, where is the water table? Where's the art easel? Where's the housekeeping corner? You know, I almost had a meltdown. Where's the book corner? You know, where, where's all the early childhood kindergarten stuff? I looked on the chalkboard. They had on the chalkboard first grade reading activities and second grade penmanship activities for these kindergarten children. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't working. When I looked at the school report card for the kindergarten in that building, 97% of those children were below grade level in kindergarten. Can you believe that? Below grade level in kindergarten, 97%. These children, 97% of the children were on free or reduced lunch. And you know what that means? That means they were po. 97% on free or reduced lunch and 90% below grade level in kindergarten. So somebody had the brilliant idea that they're just going to take these poor children and put them in first and second grade activities where they have no background for them. I asked the principal of the school, I said, how many of your children have had any kind of preschool experience? She said she didn't know. <laughs> well, if you don't know, that means that that's not something you think about. That has no importance to you. 
I asked the superintendent for curriculum instruction, how many of your children in the school district have had any kind of preschool experience? He didn't know. So that has no value. This is the point I'm making. Rich children have high quality preschool experiences. So when they get to kindergarten, they can do accelerated activities. You don't take children who've had no preschool experience and put them in the accelerated activities. All they're doing is falling farther and farther behind. This is not a complicated concept. This is not a, I mean, I'm not that smart. This is not a complicated concept. But this is what everybody is doing. The children don't have a foundation for achievement. I ask them, what kinds of occupations do the children, the parents in this uh, school work in? They said they didn't know. One of the principals, she went and got a metal box, and at the beginning of the year they gave a survey to ascertain the occupations of the parents. So she starts reading them to me. And after she read about 30, I said, okay, I got it. She said, well, no, I haven't seen these. I want to see what, what they say. This is it, May? <laughs> she just opened them up to look at them. And the, the occupation, I mean, most of them were unknown, unemployed. Uh, many, she suspected many of the mothers were prostitutes. They worked in the fast food industry. I mean, the reason this is important, uh, the presentation I gave last night, you know, I talked about there have been studies done that have documented that the numbers of words parents use who are from professional parent families with their children in an hour. I mean it's something like 2,000 for professional parents, 1,300 for working class parents, 900 for welfare parents. Children who come to school from professional families know twice the words that children coming from working class and welfare uh, families bring to school. That's on school entry. And one, last night I did a presentation on literacy with African American children. And one of the most critical issues, the, the most critical correlate with reading success is the size of your vocabulary. And when you have a twice a vocabulary at three years old, that has implications for what kind of success you're going to find in reading. Our, if, it, you know, this is not insurmountable. If we know that, if we know it, and if we're prepared on school entry to address it, then we can get these children started on the right foot immediately. But one of the realities of American education is if you come in or you fall behind, there is nobody to catch you up. <laughs> There's nobody to catch you up. There's no program to catch you up. There's nothing. You fall farther and farther behind. I was speaking in Columbus, Ohio uh, to a group of 500 teachers and one of the teachers, a white uh, teacher, stood up during the question and answer period and she said that what they're getting is white parents who are delaying the entry of their children to kindergarten because they want the children uh, to be more mature and they feel they will give their children an advantage. So you get a, a white child that's coming to kindergarten at six years old. Then you have black families who maybe can't afford preschool, but they know their children should be getting something. So they send the children early so they can get something rather than just being at home. And they, they know that there's an advantage to being in school. So they're pushing their children in as young as possible. The white people are bringing their children in as old as possible. So what they're getting on day one is a mature white child and an immature black child, and that black child is starting off from behind on the first day of school. Um, there is an article that I have, if you're interested in it, that was done by the Michigan Association for the Education of Young Children. And they evaluate all these different strategies, like junior kindergarten, beginner garden, all these extra year programs and all of this. And one of the things they're saying at the upshot, at the end of the article, after reviewing all the research, is that kindergarten should be planned for a five-year-old child. 
It should be the equalizer. Kindergarten should not, we should not be um, having all these different entry points. And, you know, I'm going to talk about this hide-and-seek. I mean, one of the problems that we have in American education is even though we say that we want equal education for all, there is a very subtle scramble in the twilight zone for parents to seek to give a more than an equal opportunity to their own children. And when you seek to give more of an equal opportunity to your children and it affects other children in the community, that is the, uh, the uh, genesis of our unequal education. And this is really the problem, that kindergarten should be for the normal five-year-old child. But when people are seeking to hold their children back and create artificial advantages. I mean, I had a discussion with my students uh, in my class last week, and we were talking about how the property values and all how the schools have been structured to give an advantage to white children and to white middle class children. And one of my students who was a devil's advocate, and I appreciated her saying it, she said, well, this is the way people feel. They feel that if they're paying more tax money for schools, then they should get better schools. And I said to her, I said, if you earn $300,000 and you pay $30,000 in uh, taxes, and somebody else earns $30,000 and they pay $10,000 in taxes, you don't get a sticker for that. <laughs> we don't give out stickers for that. Do we get stickers? You know how you go to vote and they give you a sticker that you voted today? We don't give out stickers for that. What do you get? If you make more money and pay more taxes in our society, what do you get? You get nothing. <laughs> you pay according to your income. So who came up with the idea that if you pay more taxes, you get a good school, and the people who don't pay taxes get a bad school? Whose concept was that? And why do we think that's fair? Um, my solution to the whole math issue um, one of the things that I want you to think about for a second, I have a video uh, that I don't have time to show today, but uh, it was a documentary done by ABC Evening News called Common Miracles, A New Revolution in Education. And one of the things it shows in the video is that the schools that we all think are normal really were designed as a part of the machine age. And at the turn of the century, industrialists, designed public education. And these buildings even look like factories. It's, it's called the factory model school. I don't know about you, but my high school looks like a factory. Okay? And the schools were built for the machine age and they have a um, working class machine age kind of orientation. So that at the turn of the century, you were expected to drop out, the working class people dropped out of school about seventh grade. And you were expected to go into the factory, you were to work on the assembly line. It was not expected that you would do work that was personally meaningful for you. You were supposed to do a routine and you had your role on the factory assembly line. So consequently, schooling was not uh, designed to give you raison d'etre. And you were not supposed to do activities that were interesting and personally meaningful to you. So the American classrooms were designed so that everybody lined up in rows facing the chalkboard. Everybody had a centralized curriculum. The teacher did most of the talking. The children did boring uh, mechanical kinds of tasks. And it was designed for there to be a transfer from that to the assembly line for most people. And we still have that today. The only problem is the assembly line is gone. So we have a whole population of children who are being educated in a 20th century design of education when the occupational outcomes no longer exist. Well, the same thing goes for the math curriculum. I want, you know, one of the most political issues in our country is, or educationally, is who takes math, algebra, and when do they take it? That is one of the most political issues. Who takes algebra and when do they take it? Um, when you look at black children's education, 
There was a study done that black children who get 1,200 on the SAT test have taken honors English and calculus. Now the issue is how do you get to calculus by the, by the time you take the SAT test? That's almost impossible to do. Um, I think about my son went to two private schools in the Michigan area. And the first one he went to up to from four to fourteen, and we changed to the second school because of basketball. All right, at the first, what happened? He took the Iowa test of basic skills in the fifth and fourth grade. He scored three grade levels above grade level in language and one grade level above grade level in math. Some of his white male friends scored two grade levels above grade level in math. Well, for them, they started algebra in the seventh grade. My son started algebra in the eighth grade because of one grade level above, and they were two. Okay. He would have taken algebra one in the, se in the eighth grade, geometry in the ninth grade, algebra two in the tenth grade, trigonometry in the eleventh grade, pre-calculus in the twelfth grade. Didn't get to calculus. When we moved to the school he's at now, they pride themselves on their high SAT scores. So their average scores, uh, let's see, the average is 1,300, but the range is between 12 and 15. Most people score between 12 and 15. That's on the old test, not counting the writing test, okay, the new writing test. All right, the point I'm making is at this school now, where they emphasize SAT scores, all right, he came in there, I remember, uh, eighth grade, algebra one, ninth grade, geometry, tenth grade, algebra two. All right, what they did in eleventh grade is they combined trigonometry and pre-calculus, so you get to calculus by the twelfth grade. But he took the SAT test in eleventh grade, so he still didn't get to calculus itself by the twelfth grade. All right, this is what I want you to think about. In the fifth, sixth, and see, one of the reasons they were able to skip these children one year or two years is that really and truly, by the time you get to fifth grade, really, third grade is a pivotal year in math because you've learned all the operations. In fourth and fifth grade, you really just embellish those operations. In other words, you're doing a multiplication with three digits, division with three digits, you know, that kind of stuff. You're doing the same operation, you just do more of it. Uh, by fifth grade, you have gotten m the operations. All they're doing in sixth and seventh grade is review, really. You're just practicing, pretty much, what you've already basically learned in the third through fifth grades, okay? I talked to somebody, and he said that the reason you don't learn much in the, f in the sixth and seventh grade is back at the turn of the century, people were just marking time till they dropped out. In the, fifth and, in the sixth and seventh grade, because you have to be old enough to get a work permit. And so nothing much is taught in math in the sixth and seventh grade. And that, because that was the fortune of most working class people. People who are college bound take algebra. So my point is, if we want to talk about school reform, talk about mathematical reform, I don't feel the solution is pushing multiplication down to second grade and teaching things to children younger. I think if we want to create better outcomes in terms of performance on tests, I really feel that we should start algebra in the seventh grade. That, you know, in terms of Piagetian concepts, children should be able to process it. Uh, you move to abstract thinking around the 12, 12, 13 year old age level, and it would put the children in position to perform better on standardized tests because those tests are going to measure how far you have gone in math. And when children start algebra so late, they don't have a chance to perform very well on standardized tests. Another thing that I think I noticed when I went to uh, this school is science. You know, we want to stimulate children's science performance. Most elementary schools do not have a good science curriculum that is delivered to the children. You would not believe what I saw. Um, the test, this is Missouri, the test was given in like fourth grade. So there's absolutely nothing going on with the children until they get to fourth grade. So I go in there, they're telling me field trip, this, that, the other. Why? 
because the test is given that year. That's not a science curriculum. I was in Columbus, Ohio, and the teacher stood up. She was a sixth grade teacher, and she talked about how much pressure she's under to work all these miracles in the sixth grade. I said, is the test given in the sixth grade? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so we don't care what's going on in the fifth grade, third grade, first grade, nothing. It's just the year of the test that we give those teachers a nervous breakdown. What, what is this? I look, when I looked at the grade cards for the schools, I picked out the school that had the best scores with the children in science. Okay? And I went to visit that school. Guess what that school was like? They had a teacher who taught the primary children in science. They had a science lab. The children came to the science lab. They were taught by a specialist in science. They had another teacher who taught the upper school children in science, and they came to the science lab. In the schools where it was happenstance, and the teachers got to it if they got to it, and most of them didn't get to it, the children had poor performance in science. I mean, so I don't feel like I'm that smart. I don't think this is that hard. And I don't see why. You can't have, now some schools had a team teaching situation where one teacher taught language arts, another one taught science, and all the children, you know, they alternated their children. But they need to have someone who focuses on science. I mean, when I look at the school my son went to, that's the way science was taught, which was a private school. But these are things that can be done in a, a public school setting. What I say to people who are sincerely interested in school reform, I say to them that they should have sister schools. That if you have a school that is predominantly African American, predominantly lower income, that principal should seek a sister school that is affluent, white, and middle class. And they should have a communication to look at what kinds of things are being done. Do you know what I did? I worked with the Detroit Public School for three months. And I made an arrangement for those teachers in the school I was working in to go, every teacher went for one day to the private school that my son went to. And I gave them an observation packet, what, what they were to look for. And if you taught first grade at the school I was working in, you went to first grade there. If you taught computers, you went to the computer program there. I matched them. And they just spent one day. You know, and I wanted them to just see child management, to see that a, a six-year-old child is perfectly capable of getting up and going to the bathroom by himself. <laughs> and, you know, just creating some kind of fluidity in the classroom. And you don't have to spend the whole day lining up, walking down the hall, and all these elaborate rituals that disrupt instructional time. So it's just interesting to just to see how children are being treated when you're not treating them like criminals. And that young children can function in an environment that doesn't look like a penal institution. Um, another issue that I think is important has to do with teacher training. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about my model. And one of the problems that we have, in my opinion, is the training of preschool teachers. When you look at most curricula, like at colleges of education where I teach, we have a K through 5 or K through 8th grade curriculum around the country. So if you're a kindergarten teacher, you want to teach kindergarten, you have to understand the entire elementary school curriculum. Because we don't just have a class for kindergarten teachers. We might have one course or something, but in general, you're educated with other elementary school educators. So you see what you're doing and how it relates to what these children are going to be doing in first grade, second grade, third grade. You see the whole picture. When we educate preschool teachers, we have them somewhere like at the community college by themselves. And they're focusing on preschool education. And they don't have an opportunity to see how what they are doing hooks up with kindergarten and with the entire elementary school curriculum. And it's my contention, because I'm in early childhood education, I feel that this worldview causes preschool teachers to not have enough theoretical background 
to understand why they're doing something. You know, for example, reading a book. One of the interesting things about black children's reading achievement that some scholars have pointed out is people, when black children are in, say, first grade and they're learning how to decode words, and they say, oh, these children can read. Boy, they got phonics. This is really working for black children. Look at them reading. And so they're focusing on decoding the words, and they're calling that reading. But then when the children get to fourth grade, their reading achievement goes down to grade levels. And everybody wonders why that is. Well, one of the theories is that when children are taught to read, they should, the emphasis should be given to the intellectual processes that underlie the reading process. So there are things like reasoning skills, prediction skills, comprehension skills, memory skills. So if you're reading a, a story to a child and you understand that, then you might have a three-year-old who can't read and you say, here, read or tell this story from the pictures. This is a story I read yesterday, tell the story from the pictures. That child can't read, but that child can tell the story by pointing to the pictures. That's a memory skill. A reasoning skill. Why do you think Johnny said that to Mary? That's a reasoning skill. Uh, what do you think is going to happen next? That's a prediction skill. When they ask comprehension questions, see if the children understand the storyline. Right, a teacher who is skilled and is, knows that those skills are important to later reading success are going to read that same story and have that discussion in a more skilled, artful way. So that what I see in a lot of preschool classrooms is teachers are in there doing stuff. They're doing stuff. Kids are working puzzles. They're in the water play. They're doing art. Reading books. You know, kids, they're doing stuff. But when I look at for poor black children, I'm not seeing that they know why they're doing it. The kids are over there doing stuff. But the teacher is not in there in a skilled way where that teacher really understands what things are critical and how critical it is to, de to deliver this to the children. So I think that this segmented, you know, it's really because we don't value preschool education. We don't think those kids are doing anything, the teachers are doing anything, we don't think they're important, the credential is less, the pay is less. It's a devaluation and lack of appreciation for how good that foundation is. Because if you accept my assertion, which I hope you will, that nobody's going to catch these children up, this need to embrace these children when they come, however they come, and make sure these children are ready to be seated at table number one on the first day of kindergarten is our mission. That's the, most, the easiest solution to the achievement gap. But we don't see that as a solution. And when these children get to school and they're at table number three, it's over for them before the game begins. I mean, I had a preschool that I ran for seven years in Cleveland, and I have the curriculum and everything. I shared it last night. And what I said to the parents in my program, <clears throat> everything we do with your child from two until four years old when they leave us at five is designed to have your child seated at table number one on the first day of kindergarten. That's our goal. And it's so interesting. I started this program back in the 80s, and it was about uh, last semester I went to my office and the I had a phone call. And it was a father from one of my uh, children in my preschool. And he lived in Cleveland, that's where I had the program, and he said, Dr. Hale, I just wanted to find you. My, my um, assignment was to find you. He said, our children graduated from high school this past summer, and they were all in Visions for Children, and we were friends, and you know, we went to open houses when our children graduated, and we were talking about how well our children were doing. And we wanted you to know that we feel our children's success is indexed to being in your Visions for Children program. And I almost fainted. I told my mother, I said, brother, you, you don't think you're ever going to get credit for anything in your whole life. Will somebody say that? And he said, my daughter 
um, got a scholarship to attend the University of Chicago and she turned it down to go to Spelman. Uh, there is, he, he sent me a newspaper article. He said that one of the boys in your program was the first black male valedictorian of the Cleveland High School District in the history of the school district. They had an article on him and the plain dealer and he is going to be a neurosurgeon. He said, she, he said to me, he said, the curriculum that you gave our children in preschool was better than what she got in kindergarten and better than what she got in the first grade. And I said, well, I mean, I just was floored. And he said, we want to, and we just knew you didn't know. We knew you didn't know. And we want to bring you back and honor you uh, for what you did for our children. Now, I did know, we did research on the children, and we evaluated them, and I even published some of the findings in the Early Childhood Research Quarterly, where, you know, I knew they were scoring off the chart up until, I followed them up until about the eighth grade. But, uh, you know, I moved to Michigan and just lost track of everyone. But I believe firmly that part of our problem is the training given to preschool teachers. Now, I want to show you one thing in the handout. Would you please refer to one sheet? I think it is. It says play activities at the top. Looks like this. I just wanted, I, I share this sheet, not to really go over it, but to make my point that when you see that there are activities with perceptual development, the kinds of things we do in early childhood education, and how those things feed into subject matter areas, and these are the things that we need to be sure that preschool teachers understand. Because if you understand fully what the payoff is and what the next steps are, then you're going to be more precise in the activities that you engage in with children. And I speak at early childhood conferences and they say, well, we want make and take. I want make and take. I want something I can take uh, back to my classroom to use. Monday. I don't want to hear a whole bunch of theory. I want something with some ribbons and some bows on it. And they don't see theory as something they can take back to their classroom. They don't see that. You know, we want to we play shop. We want to dance. We want to sing. And they're not looking at how important it is to know why it is what we're doing. That's the problem. One of the hysterias we have today is this hysteria around high stakes testing because they're taking everybody's money and they're resolving, they're dissolving the school. Nobody's teaching anybody how to do anything. They're just coming in and taking people's money. There's no leadership at the national level to try to crystallize some of these practices. They're just taking people's money. And one of the things they're doing now is they have what they call constructive responses. Okay. And that is, in the old days when you took a test, you just filled in a bubble, multiple choice. Now they want you to write out the answer. Now who do you think that benefits and who do you think that penalizes? Black children are going to do worse in writing out the answers, all right? Well, a principal in this state said something to me that I want you to remember. And she said, you can't descend upon a group of second or third grade black children and give them a test and have them writing and they're supposed to be proficient and fluent writers. She said, you have to talk it before you write it. <laughs> you understand? You have to talk it before you write it. And you don't just jump in there and start having people write and say, oh, the kids can't write, too bad, your money's taken away. Where do you think you learn to talk it? You talk it in preschool and kindergarten. But they're eliminating kindergarten. Functionally, kindergarten as we know it is being eliminated. The children aren't getting any preschool education, basically. So they're eliminating and watering down the entity 
that has so much critical importance. Many African American children come from families where the parents do not engage the children in conversation. They don't let the children express their feelings. And so if you are in a family where you come to school and all you hear is shut up and stop it, where are you supposed to develop an imagination? Where are you supposed to develop ideas? You know, the writing process is idea generation. Where do you get some ideas that you're putting down to paper? So if you come from a home environment like that, the preschool experience is going to be doubly critical for you. Now, when you get to preschool, then they start using duct tape, <laughs> tape you to the chair, duct tape over your mouth, tying your hands together with basket tape. So where are you supposed to get an idea from? Who's listening to your thoughts? How you feel? So we have a repressive home environment and we have a punitive school environment where everybody wants to know how to discipline you. That's all they care about. You know, if I would go out and do workshops on how to discipline black children, I would be a millionaire. <laughs> I wouldn't have time to eat dinner. If, that, if I would do a workshop on that, I would be a millionaire. Nobody wants to hear what I'm talking about now. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk, hear about how to treat black children and create a humane learning environment. But everybody wants to know how to discipline them. So what we need to look at is preschool is where the children need to talk. Preschool is where their ideas need to be treasured and valued. You know, last night when we talked about language, uh, children need to develop descriptive language. That's how you end up writing poetry. That's how you end up writing po prose. When you're encouraged to speak and notice and use words in a descriptive way. So everything I have seen just further values how important precision in what we're teaching children in preschool is. Then we have another problem, and that is lack of diagnostic assessment. Whew. My son uh, went to his new school, the, the high school he goes to, and he had a C in Algebra 1. When he got, he had that coming in. Then when he went to Geometry, the first semester he had a C minus, and by January it was a D plus. So then my alarm bell started going off. So in desperation, of course, I didn't understand that school, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, at that school, the instructional accountability infrastructure is tutoring. And I didn't realize everybody over there was for, were being tutored. But anyway, not knowing that, I took him to Sylvan Learning Center. How many of you had experiences with Sylvan Learning Center? Okay, it was interesting. I took, you know, this is the way I felt about it. I'm paying these people over here, and now i got to go pay some more people, okay? <laughs> All I'm doing is paying people, and nobody's uh, teaching them anything. So I went in with my new people to pay, and they gave him a two-hour test, and I picked him up. I, I was amazed. When I got back, they had a color-coded computer printout where they showed me exactly from the age of third grade to, he was in 10th grade, what he didn't know. Meaning a different color for every grade, what he was missing in, in fractions, what he was missing based on the test. Oh, this is amazing. And they said that his ability to set the problems up was at, let me see, he was in the ninth grade. So his ability was at the 10th grade, eight month level in setting the problems up because he was taking a 10th grade course. Geometry was a 10th grade course. But his capacity to solve the problems was at the seventh grade, eight month level. And then my son said, Mom, Shin Yi messed me up. And I said, What are you talking about? I shouldn't say her name. Uh, and I said, What are you talking about? He had a Chinese teacher in the seventh grade, and he said he could not understand what she was saying. When she did the problem, she talked to the chalkboard. You know how you do that. You're talking to the chalkboard and the children over here, and then they could, still couldn't understand what they were saying. She was saying it even when she talked to them. So he got stuck at the seventh grade in terms of his calculations. Well, they had a we devised a plan where he would do his homework so we could help him get through geometry. 
but then also work on trying to fill in the blanks of the things that he was not proficient in. Well, when I looked at this, I said, all they used was the California Achievement Test. Anybody can get that. I said, now, why am I paying these idiots over here all this money? And I, you know, why couldn't they get the California Achievement Test and show what the boy doesn't know? He had to take a four-hour test to get into school. And they gave me a little printout. But when you think about it, if you are 10 months, 8, uh, at the 10th grade, eight-month level on setting the problems up and seventh grade eight-month level in the calculations, if you average that out, that's about average, you see? So they're not pinpointing what the problem was. And I'm wondering, well, why can't they do this? And this is my question. Why can't the schools do this? Why, when a child is not doing well, <laughs> can't the school give them the same test, run, took them two minutes to run it through their little computer, give the parent a printout, at least pinpoint what the problem is? But there's no diagnosis. When I went to talk to my son's teacher, and I'm not even going to tell you how much money I'm paying for this school. I'll tell you this, it costs twice what it, go, it costs to go to University of Michigan. Twice the tuition, all right? And I look at what this, the math teacher, my son is getting a 100 in homework and getting 65s and 60s and all this on the quizzes and the tests. And you know why? because the teacher doesn't grade the homework papers. They have a new thing, ladies and gentlemen, called homework check. Okay, you know what homework check is? That is, you just walk around the room and look at the notebook and look like it looks like they did it or not. And it's giving these children 100%. Okay, the child is happy. You think my son was happy? He was happy. He's getting 100% on his homework. I'm happy when I get the progress report. And then it took an inquiring mind to want to know how can the boy get 100% on his homework and getting all these bad grades on his quizzes and his tests. And I went to see the teacher and he's going to sit there trying to justify that to me. I told him, I said, you know what, I don't care if you're getting away with not grading 70 people's homework, that means you only have one person's to grade. And you know whose that is. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here today to ask you whether you want to leave this right here and whether you're going to grade that one person's homework. Who ever heard of a math teacher who doesn't grade homework? Now, this is in the school where I'm paying grand theft money. <laughs> grand theft money. What is going on in the schools where they're the poor schools that everybody's going to that are public? So we have this, okay? I spoke to some black males in Kansas City. They teach eighth grade math. And they were talking about the black males in their classes, how they misbehave, cut up, act like they don't want to learn anything, and ask my advice on what to do. I asked them, I said, when you start teaching algebra to these boys or whatever math they were, I think they were teaching algebra in eighth grade or ninth grade. It was middle school, so it was eighth grade algebra, I think. I said, when you start teaching them, do you open the book and start teaching, or do you give them any kind of assessment to see what they know? And guess what they said? Open the book and start teaching. I have spoken to 500 teachers in Columbus, Ohio. I said, everybody who's a secondary teacher, raise your hand. Do we have any secondary teachers here? And I asked um, all the secondary teachers to raise their hands so I can know who they were. And I said, okay, how many of you, before you start teaching, assess what your children know? How many of you open a book and start teaching? Every one of them said, open a book and start teaching. When you have children who are behind, I said, those boys probably don't know what in the world you're talking about. And middle school children are very creative about erecting strategies to mask the fact that they don't know what you're talking about and can't do that work. And they just looked at me like I had just come in from the twilight zone or something. This is not that hard. So we don't have any kind of assessment. We don't have any kind of orientation toward catching anybody up. We don't even want to know where they are. All we want to do is what? grade them. Our job as teachers is to grade. Now I'm going to share with you 
um, something that's theoretical. And I want you to follow me because, see, I feel that if we get some of these theoretical concepts, it's not that hard to figure out what to do. And this is an important one. I devoted a whole chapter to this in my book. And I called it Mastery versus the Bell Curve. I submit to you that we have in our society today a mastery culture that does not match the culture of the school. The outside society focuses on mastery. The inside culture of the school focuses on grading. And this herein lies one of the fundamental problems we have in education. Now let me start off by talking about the outside society and what it's like. I call it a mastery society. The governor, you remember when Engler was governor? Republican. He closed the mental hospitals and threw the mentally ill people out on the street and they filled up the homeless shelters. He wiped off welfare, wiped out welfare, threw everybody off welfare. And when these activities occurred, then you have an increase in the building of prisons. Ladies and gentlemen, the only place in our society where there's agreement, where we put people who can't function, is prison. Everybody is willing to incarcerate the people who cannot function. And James Comer made the statement that never in the history of the world has a person been required to have the level of education that is required in order to meet our adult responsibilities today. Never in the history of the world has a person had to have the educational level that's required. And you know, we don't even talk about troubleshooting. You know, like you get your singular wireless bill and then they charge you five to six hundred dollars a month and you think you're on a program and you ain't on no program or your program's running over in what they spend. I mean, you could spend your whole life on the phone with all the people who are trying to cheat you and uh, press one if you want to talk to somebody. Press two if you're on fire. Press three if it's a cynical world. Press four if a bomb just dropped. You know, I mean, you can't talk to anybody. You can't find anybody. It takes a PhD just to pay your bill. It's just unbelievable. So the level of, of education today is astounding. The reason we're here today and the reason our task is so difficult as teachers is that not only is the level of education higher today, everybody must meet that level in a new way. You know, I've had people say to me, well, why, you know, why is it we got to have seminars on teaching these kids, blah, blah, blah. I went to school, we did this, we did that. This is one thing people don't understand. Prior to 1950, most of the people in our society didn't even go to school. They didn't even present themselves for schooling. I want to give you a little example. In my book, Unbank the Fire, I tell the life stories of my mother and father. Um, and I centered the book on the topic of upward mobility because it's my contention that the devices that enable people in days gone by to rise above their parents are gone and that's supposed to be the role of schooling. When white, the public schools were not designed for black people, the public schools were designed for the children of white immigrants around the turn of the century. And it was possible for you, to come, your ancestors, to have come here as an uneducated, unskilled immigrant. And within three generations, you become head and CEO of a Fortune 500 company because the schools provided that opportunity. And so I wanted to look at my parents. My father pastored a large church in Columbus, Ohio for 43 years and retired. He's retired now. He was a state legislator in Ohio for 14 years. He was chairman of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, president of the NAACP, 
uh, the board of operation push. They have a street named for him in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, when he went to Morehouse College, he knew Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They were personal friends. We grew up as children. He stayed in our home twice when he came to preach for my father. Um, and my father was a sharecropper's son from Mississippi. And when we were children, he would tell us stories about what it was like for him growing up on a cotton plantation, picking cotton. Uh, he had to walk four miles to school each way. Um, and just what it, and it was like a, such a strange world to us because we would go from Columbus to Atlanta by car. We'd go from Columbus to Buffalo, New York for vacations. And he would just enthrall us with, with such a different world. And I always felt that his story should be told. Uh, and so I'm not a creative writer, so I decided to tell it as a biography. Well, one little anecdote that I want to share with you. I always wondered why my father, with their 12 children in the family, why was he the only one to go to college and graduate from college? And uh, all of his brothers and sisters were bright and intelligent and charismatic and colorful. And I just wondered, why was he the only one? And uh, I came up with this hypothesis that it was because he was the sixth child. I felt that being a middle child positioned him because there were boys around him in birth order who could compensate for the work he wasn't doing. Uh, in sharecropper parlance, they would say that when you have 12 or 13 children, you could waste one to get an education because wasting meant that child was not productive on the farm. Well, my father told us a story of, oh, another factor is John Harris came back from Chicago. John Harris was my fa became my father's best friend. In fact, he even married his sister. John Harris's grandfather lost his wealth during the Depression. He owned property in Chicago. And when the Depression hit, he came back to Mississippi to the plantation and brought his grandson John with him. And Daddy and John got to be best friends. Well, because John had gone to school in Chicago, he um, was in the eighth grade. And his grandfather allowed him to go to school in Greenwood. The schools my father went to were on the plantation. And the qualification to be a teacher was that you had completed the grade you were teaching. You had children from five years old to 15 in the same classroom. And Daddy said when he was in the second grade, third grade, he asked the teacher if he could move back to the third grade, cause, back to the second grade, because his best friend was in the second grade. And she said, that'll be fine. <laughs> and I told one of, my, one of my friends from Yale, she said, well, what did moving back to the second grade entail, moving over to the next bench? I said, pretty much. <laughs> so that's the quality of education he was getting. And uh, I said in my book that the governor of Mississippi, James K. Vardamus, he pretty much summed up the educational goals for black children during that time. He said the only geography a nigger needs to know is how to get from his shack to his plow. <laughs> so everything that was done with him was designed to turn them into sharecroppers, okay? Well, my father's parents allowed him to go into Greenwood with John. And he received stimulation in Greenwood. I, it's so interesting. When I lived in Mississippi, I had the occasion to meet a dentist who um, went to the same school my father went to. He was younger, but he remembered my father because my father would come back and speak to the kids in high school. And he gave me a lot of information on the Greenwood community. And he said the black community in Greenwood was very nurturant of the children and there even were a group of white women who created a club called the Lucky Club where they provided enrichment activities for the black student children and my father was in the Lucky Club. So a lot of things that happened with him <coughs> happened because he went to Greenwood. Well he was on the way to school one day and the uh, plantation owner picked him up and gave him a ride into Greenwood and on the way he asked him why is your father letting you go into Greenwood to school? And what effect is that having on your brothers and sisters? And what about your brother Buddy? Buddy was younger, older than Daddy. He said, what about your uh, brother Buddy? And Daddy said, Buddy wants to plow. Now the reason I'm telling you that little anecdote, 
Ladies and gentlemen, in years gone by, prior to 1950, we never saw a buddy and his friends because they could opt out of the educational process. You see, we didn't see buddy. <laughs> and the central problem we have in the education of black children today is we don't have anything for Buddy and his friends. Now, we look at my father. I mean, Daddy said he would get up sometime and pick cotton in the moonlight so he could get to school. And he said he couldn't believe that he would walk four miles to school and get there on time and the children who lived across the street would be late. I mean, they were probably certifiable geniuses. They didn't need any special education. They didn't need any IEPs. They didn't need any counselors or therapists or special programs because they were so highly motivated. So that when Daddy finished high school, he finished Greenwood Colored High School in 1933. And he finished high school on Friday and Monday he started walking, trying to get out of Mississippi so he could go to school. And he ended up being a hobo on a freight train. The hobo showed them how you caught the trains and how you got off. And he went to uh, Chicago, where he was not able to find a job. And then he went hobo to Buffalo, New York, where he had a sister who had a husband who worked in the steel mills and was able to get him a job working in the steel mills. And he was able to save the money to go to Morehouse College. When I looked at the headshots of those children who finished in 1933, there were 16 of them. Eleven of them were girls, and only five were boys. And I had an informant who was a cousin of mine. He followed my father through all the shacks in Mississippi and eventually to Morehouse College and got a master's degree and was head of a VA hospital in Buffalo, New York. And he provided a lot of information for my book. And what he said to me, he said, even though this wasn't slavery and even though this was supposed to be in sharecropping, he said, you virtually had to ask the plantation owner for permission for a boy to go to school. You virtually, you know, you can slide the girls through unnoticed, but you will have an able-bodied boy in school where there's farm work to be done. I mean, that accounts for the, the difference in the girls and the boys. And um, one of the things that I'm interested in, which I'm going to talk uh, this afternoon about, is what's going on with black males. And I'm thinking about the agricultural and agrarian antecedents for difficulties with black males. Because um, I'm reading a book about Muddy Waters, the blues singer, and it's so funny, I wish I had read it before I wrote my book, uh, Unbank the Fire, because, you know, by his being a, a blues singer, you hear all about during sharecrop and they had juke joints and where everybody partied on the weekend and all. And uh, I told Mother, I said, when I was interviewing Clem and Daddy, I didn't get anything about the parties and the juke joints and all that. She said, well, the hells went to church. <laughs> so I got none of that flavor, okay? But one little sentence in Muddy Waters' book, I think illustrates the point I'm making. He said, in the spring, when the plowing had to be done, the boys had to come out of school. Now, cotton, everybody picked cotton, girls and boys. But the girls could stay in school longer because the plowing was heavy work that the boys had to do. And so, you know, in our community, we have associated academic tasks with femininity and what girls do. Now, I have a little audience participation for you right here. Um, in the Y family, if you have three children, one, uh, you have girls and boys, okay, three children, and the family can only afford to send one child to school, what child will it be? The oldest boy. Everybody agree? In the black family, if you can have the same three children, but you can only send one child to school, who will it be? Now, I used to say the oldest girl, but I'm starting now to think in some cases it's the youngest girl because the family has more money when they get down to the youngest one. And then people have told me also there's sometimes the expectation that the older ones who maybe are working would help send the younger one to school, okay? This is just true. <laughs> and this has been true since forever. 
And my father used to preach on this when I was a child. And he used to say, well, the way the families feel is, you know, a boy, he could get a blue-collar job, construction, work in a factory, he'll be all right. But the girl, well, we don't want her to embarrass the family by getting pregnant, and we want to protect her, and then we want her to go to college and marry a professional man. And my father used to raise the rhetorical question in his sermons, who is raising these professional men for everybody's daughter to marry. <laughs> if that's the way we think, who's raising the professional men? But that, that's what people think. Well, the point I'm making is that I want you to see the agrarian antecedents for a differential treatment of black male going, males going back to slavery and going back to sharecropping. But the major point I want you to get is our society is unforgiving when it comes to mastery. That either you is or you ain't. And the only place for you is prison, which is why we have so many African American males in prison. Now, I want to talk to you for about the bell curve within the school. This is what the educational psychologists have taught us. Okay, everybody knows about the bell curve. Okay. Okay, let's try blue. Okay, this is the bell curve that we're taught about in educational psychology. So, if you're a teacher and you give a test or some kind of assignment, if you have a normal distribution of children in your class, then this number should get an A. This number, a comparable number, same proportion, should get an F. Okay, so this number should look just like that number. Then over here, you have a group who will get a B, and the same comparable number will get a D. The most children in your class will be located right here, and they will get a C. Okay? Now this is what the psychologists teach us. And so your job as a teacher is grading. Your job as a teacher is to ferret out as soon as possible the children who can benefit from an enriched curriculum, the ones who are gifted, the children who won't learn much, so we won't attempt to teach them much, <laughs> and the children who are just normal. So the psychologists give us the tests, and the tests are so fair. It's a tool that they give us so that we, as quickly as possible, can figure out who these people are. And we put them in tables one, two, and three. And the kind of interaction they have with us and the kinds of experiences that are provided for them are dictated by how they fall. Our job is not to take the people who don't know and teach them. You know, I told my son's teacher in this school that cost me all this money, I said, you are teaching the people who already know. <laughs> it's fun to teach the people who already know. Isn't, isn't that fun? <laughs> it's so much fun. You see, when I figured out uh, that tutoring was the infrastructure in my son's school, See, this is the point. I'm going to talk to you about instructional accountability infrastructure. This is what's happening with rich people. See, with middle class people, the mothers are the instructional accountability infrastructure. But with rich people, tutoring is the um, instructional accountability infrastructure. So that, and that's why my son did worse in the 10th grade because I hadn't figured that out yet. And so what we had to do in 11th grade 
All right, he took physics. The physics people could tutor math, pre-calculus, and physics. So my son would go on Sunday and get tutored by the physics person in physics and pre-calculus and do all of his homework the week before it was assigned. So that when he went to class, he already knew it, had already done the homework. And then the teacher started liking him. His physics teacher just loved him. Loved him. Why? Because he had to teach him anything. That's what we, that's what we call smart. <laughs> that's what we call smart. The people we don't have to teach. Every progress report I got from physics was just glowing. He's wonderful. He was wonderful all of a sudden. Because they didn't have to teach him. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Wade Boykin is a professor at Howard University, and he made the statement that psychologists have helped us with talent assessment. That's what this is, talent assessment. We are not going to close the achievement gap until we move from talent assessment to talent development. You see? We don't have talent development in American schools. Tests are used to categorize people, rule people out, cancel people out, shuffle them around. But the orientation is not to have you come in knowing nothing to knowing something. Now, my suggestion is if we could move schools to match this outside society, our problem would be solved. If we, instead of having the bell curve culture, see, this is the culture we have in the school. My obligation is met once I grade you. <laughs> and then I explain to your parents how you ain't going to be nothing. That's what we do. We, we sit down and explain to the children, the first kindergarten, they ain't going to be nothing because I'm grading. When we move to a mastery culture in the school, then we start diagnosing the children to see where they are. And then we see it as our obligation to have the children functioning on grade level. That's, that's, that's what we see as our obligation. All right, what is a mastery culture like? All right, I had an opportunity at my son's school, the, the lower one, the, uh, the one he went to from 4 to 14. I saw what it's like. And there are some mastery cultures. All right, one of the things they did, anytime they took did homework or took a test in science or math, the children, if you did not get 80%, you had to take that test over until you got 80%. There was no going on to the next thing for you. You had to pass that test at 80% or you did not go on. That's mastery. Anytime they had homework, a quiz, or a test in which they did not get 100, they had to correct their paper and turn it back in. So that the teacher's orientation was not just getting a grade. I got your grade. The orientation was you have to go through and correct this so you see what the correct answers are. Another thing they did is the children did not get any grades until they were in the seventh grade. We got progress reports, like 10 page progress reports, so we knew exactly how they were doing. We were told what they were working on. We were told whether the children had mastered it, but no grades were given. We were in church, and they were talking about uh, the honor roll. And my son whis whispered to me, he said, Mom, what's the honor roll? He didn't even heard of the honor roll. Because at this school, they weren't comparing the children. You're better than this one. You're worse than this one, all that. You were evaluated on whether you met the standard that they were working on. Now, when they get to seventh grade and start getting grades, you cannot get less than a C in that school because if your grade is less than C, you have to take that class over until you get a C. That's mastery. Do you see? So I um, know some of you have to go, but so I'm going to end this part making this statement. The answer to all of this, in my opinion, is that we need to have every child in this country functioning on grade level in reading in the first grade. If we do this one little thing, we could create a revolution. But nobody but me is saying that. The president 
his secretary of education, what did they say? Oh, all of our children, we want them reading by third grade. That's what everybody says. State, Jennifer Granholm, everybody. I have not heard any living person say that our goal is for every child to be on grade level in reading by first grade. You might not make it, but it's not going, you're certainly not going to make it if you don't set it as a goal. What's wrong with saying that? That's what I want to know. Why can't they say it? If I were a superintendent, I would stop the bleeding. With the next cohort group, I don't care what I had to do. I make sure every child was on grade level in reading in the first grade. And then math, we could create a revolution if every child were on grade level in math by the third grade. And I say third grade for math because the third grade is such an important grade with all the different operations. If we have everybody at that level at third grade, we could create a revolution. And I'm going to end with this point. I was in Richmond, Virginia speaking for a community forum. And they called the community forum because the penal institution in Richmond told them at a previous forum that the way they decide how many prison beds they're going to need in the future is the number of children in the second grade who are below grade level. And they do this with accuracy. That is their predictor, ladies and gentlemen. So if you think I'm just blowing wind up here, talking about early childhood, this is the tool they use with accuracy to predict how many prison beds they need. So what we are doing is critical. We need to become more skilled at it. We need to develop the concept. There's a conceptual fault between what's going on in school districts. 